I'm part of the Ho-Chunk Nation. I am Ojibwe, Native American. I'm part Oneida and part Chickasaw. I'm a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation. I'm Mohawk, from the Bear Clan. We just know it as a big Indian. Well, I'm thinking about old Hiawatha Indian legend, and I assume that that is what, uh, to me, that that is what the, the, the statue kind of represents. I look at it and I see something that's offensive to others. Um, and I also want to just mention that my mom is part Native American, so um, in a way it also offends me. I guess it's different. It's interesting, I feel like it's outdated, but because it's historical, I feel like it's okay. What makes you feel like it's The paint faded? Yeah, it's not bright. I like it, it's a historical uh, piece of art. It's um, a good use of culture um, for people coming down here to see how the land grew up before them. The Hiawatha statue Standing 25 feet tall in Riverside Park, the statue was completed in 1961 by a local artist. It is commonly referred to as the Big Indian. It's a monstrosity. The problem is that the statuary, just like the Big Indian or all other representations, as an overwhelming rule, Native America is always presented in the past. We lack modernity, and that causes a huge problem in the way that we vote or just generally think about Indians. The like Native imagery that we have around town, um, specifically Hiawatha statue, isn't accurate. So I think when people go down there and they see it and then they want to go learn more about it, um, they could be reading inaccurate information and things just don't align up. Um, so then... You have the wrong idea, and then you're just going around spreading more wrong information. American Indian imagery spreads further than La Crosse's river shores. For many years, the University of Wisconsin La Crosse Eagles was represented by a different mascot, the Indians. Originally, there was strong opposition when it came to changing the 52-year-old nickname. When given the chance to choose a new mascot from a list of suggestions, over 900 university students wrote in to keep the mascot as the Indians. One of the arguments that fans tend to make in favor of American Indian mascots is, well, you know, it's a, it's a tradition, it's a long tradition. You know, it's been 50 years, it's been 75 years that this particular team has had this mascot and why should someone have to change a 75 year old tradition it's going to cost them money to revamp an image it's going to cost them money to revamp a name and i often think to myself well how old are the traditions that are potentially being mocked or mimicked right those are hundreds of years old when you're talking about people's cultural traditions or their dress However, the university felt a moral obligation to recognize the need for change, and in 1989, the eagle became the new mascot. While UWL seems to have made progress, there are still many that feel the use of this imagery is harmless. American Indian imagery is used as a symbol in La Crosse because of the land's historical context. The images portrayed represent American Indians in general, but fail to represent the Ho-Chunk tribal nation that occupies the La Crosse area. I think it's something that everybody could understand and, 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 and was supposed to be just, here's what we think all Indians look like, and it's a big one. 
The Chamber of Commerce wanted to use the name Hiawatha to identify La Crosse as the starting point of the Hiawatha Valley. Also, members in favor of the statue felt Chief Hiawatha, quote, embodied the noblest qualities of the Red Man, end quote. However, people opposed to the name Hiawatha feel that in combination with the statue's dress, it is an inaccurate representation of the people in the area. The city chose Hiawatha, a Mohawk chief, dressed in Plains Indian attire to represent the Ho-Chunk people. Hiawatha wasn't Ho-Chunk, so first of all, I think that's a little weird to have him like as a giant statue on Ho-Chunk land, historically. Um, he was like part of the Iroquois Confederation. As far as I know, he was never even in the area and it just doesn't really make sense. It's a nice idea of having him standing out over the river, but it's kind of a misrepresentation of the people who do live here. Generalizations like these, although may seem harmless, are often reflected upon negatively by the people they represent. La Crosse is also home to a large German population, but the community does not represent Germans with offensive imagery as they do with American Indians. But I'm German and I don't drink and I don't eat brats, you know, so and I don't play accordion. So, I mean, what 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 does that say about my my German heritage? So we all have our ideas of what what each nationality or ethnicity is, and it may not conveniently fit into something. And thank God there isn't a. Uh, beer drinking, accordion playing, later hosen clad, German guy up here at the center of the park. I mean, if I was a German guy, I would, I would say, that's not me. At the turn of the century, an effort was made to remove the statue. Along with the harmful imagery, community members voiced that the statue was deteriorating and therefore hurting the city's image. Originally, the city did not have enough funds to restore the statue, and along with the public opposition, it seemed that Hiawatha did not have a place in La Crosse. In the early 2000s, NASA um, teamed up with DOC, the Diversity Organization Coalition, um, and attempted to take down the Hiawatha statue down at Riverside Park. The numerous attempts to remove the statue were ignored. Many people expressed that the statue honors the people it represents, and therefore its intentions outweigh its inaccuracies. We say, well, you know, if you really are trying to honor a tribal nation, or if you're really trying to honor an individual, what seems to me that you would want as accurate as a representation as you could possibly get to, you know, to honor that person. You know, you don't. You know, you don't say, oh, you know, we're honoring Chief Little Crow and put up a statue that resembles, you know, a different um, chief like Red Cloud or something like that. I mean, you just don't do that sort of thing. Or, you know, the African-American equivalent say, you know, we, OK, we're going to we're going to honor Malcolm X. But then you put up a statue of Frederick Douglass. Stereotypes may appear to be harmless at first, but when they become the only knowledge a person has about an ethnic group, people begin to rely upon those stereotypes as factual information. Problems that are associated with it is it, it kind of locks people into a certain identity and it locks people into a certain uh, place and time uh, as well. Uh, and when you stereotype somebody, especially with imagery, uh, in a sense dehumanizes them. They are no longer people, they are simply the image. There are numerous stereotypes in which American Indians are depicted as, including the savage who is wild, uncivilized, and dangerous. The warrior is a brave soldier and always ready to fight, and the noble savage is peaceful yet unrefined. These stereotypes have left lasting impressions on society. My dad used to take me to like the powwow or show me how we would actually do things or some of our cultural events. And I would go to those and I would see how that's done and then I would see something on TV like portraying Native Americans as like savages or riding around on horseback and um, and knowing that's not who I was, I never really had, to, had a problem believing or seeing that as a fictional um, symbol. 
These stereotypes will continue to be perpetuated as long as native voices are being ignored and manipulated by whites who remain in control of media production. Does a group have the power to control the presentation of their own image or their own representations in the media? Because the history of both the federal and state governments interactions with American Indians is that it's always whites that are in control. And people don't necessarily understand that even in this debate, if we are not listening to, if we are not consulting, if we are not paying attention to, to what indigenous folks are saying about these things, even if they're disagreeing amongst themselves, the danger is that then we're simply replicating the power dynamic. White Americans like to have Native American images and like to actually dress up like Native Americans because it gives them a claim to being American. It gives them a claim to the, the physical continent. Throughout the history of the United States, American Indians have been categorized as one homogenous group of people rather than individually acknowledging different tribal nations and their cultures. When we take measurements of the public and the perception of Native Americans, one glaring fact is, is that the public has no understanding that there are over 500 different Native American nations as different as the Spanish are from the Welsh, as the Polish are uh, from the French. The, the, these ethnic, we have different languages, different religions, different foods, etc. But in the American perception, it's an amalgamation. We're all the same. And so that is a problem with having a Native American from a thousand miles away representing. It's much more important, my clan and my tribal identification, than the fact I belong to this fabricated group called American Indian. I'm Mohawk, which is far more important than being an American Indian, which is kind of a, a generalized racial category. It's like the difference between, if you're from Jamaica, in the United States you're considered black, but to that person, being from Jamaica is far more important than the created racial class of black. One's a culture group, and the other is very much a racial an artificial racial category. Inaccurate portrayals have damaging effects that formulate at a young age and may carry lifelong repercussions. And the um, American Psychological Association has put out a, a position paper on mascots that I think would apply to the Big Indian in that he's sort of the mascot of the city. And there's a measurable drop in self-esteem between American and before and after American Indian children are exposed to these images. Kenneth and Mamie Clark in 1939 proved to us that uh, marginalized groups or oppressed groups internalize that oppression. So we no longer need an oppressor, we start oppressing ourselves. And that's what that kind of imagery does when it's all, when it's always the same. It's always in the past, it's never sophisticated, it's never modern, it really doesn't present Native America in a, uh, a varied light that we're possible of all the other things, we have the same capacity that everyone else does. No, it's extremely limiting. And so as I see all these, and, and the statues we're talking about, there's plenty of advertising signs around town as well that do the same thing. And so I don't want my children growing up the way I did, hating myself, because I started to believe all this, you choose your own adjective, around us. We're seen as invisible people. Um, people don't think that we're still here, and people don't understand that like a Native American can just be walking down the street in jeans and a t-shirt just like any other person. Um, I think people associate Native Americans with like traditional uh, clothing and music and um, if they're not seeing that, they don't think of Natives. Well, I think one thing they need to recognize is that we are here. There are American Indians in the city and that we are here as American Indians. 21st, 21st century American Indians are still tribal people. And 
we respond and think of ourselves as tribal people. And they need to stop trying to put us on the cave walls. Most of what I know about my culture is modern. I do know some of the traditional things, but they're not really reflected here. Take a look at the patterns. Uh, they're very clear. We never see Native America as anything but archaic. It's always in the past. It's walking around town, uh, in our textbooks, in our commercials, in our movies, etc. Um, yeah, let's let's do something about that. But why are we somehow expected to uphold this antiquated view, or this antiquated? uses antiquated technology that somehow makes us authentic. And I deeply resent that, and I think most American Indians do. Native Americans have not disappeared. Uh, their issues are real, their concerns are real, their perceptions of how they're being treated are real. And continuing to put them in the past uh, has real implications on what's gonna happen to them. Combating the problems associated with racial marginalization starts with people acknowledging their own privileges. They've gone through this world and existed in a world of, of whiteness and, and white privilege and racial privilege where they don't have to be concerned with things, at least in their minds, that are not directly related to them, that don't directly affect them. And yet, I try to emphasize that, that, that racism, that um, ethnocentrism, that racial marginalization impacts all of us, even if it seems to not directly affect someone. Today, the struggle to remove the Hiawatha statue continues. The Ho-Chunk, community leaders, and the city are working together to create probable solutions for the statue. Some say repainting the statue would be suitable. However, other solutions are more favorable. I think possibly replacing it with something even better, something more representative, would be much better for everybody. The better option would be to temper it, to complement it. Let's have some contemporary, modern images, Native Americans in fruit of the loom underwear, just like everybody else. Or the other option is to eliminate it all completely. Um, I prefer the first option. Really what needs to happen in terms of respectability is being in dialogue with a, a number of and a diversity of American Indians who can give some input on this issue, right? And so that we are making informed and smart and wise choices. It is imperative to have the city support and to listen to one another. I think that the community can start just by listening. Everyone's so fast to defense those because they think they're historical. Um, but just listening to the people, the Ho-Chunk people, the Native people in the area, if they're saying it's misrepresentation or they don't like it, hear them out because they're not saying it for no reason. And I also think it's important that as a city, we show that we're changing and we're doing things different than they have in the past. And uh, moving the culture forward, especially with what you have going on in the country, you have a lot of things going on where things are coming to a head and they're being called out and you need to change that. Another effective way to tackle imagery issues would be to cease mocking American Indians through one's own personal choices. Maybe at first, dealing with uh, the problems on, on small levels. Um, having people make personal choices not to wear things that are offensive, not to dress in ways that are offensive and, and that mimic or, or in a sense mock Native Americans. I think those are the best places to start. The example of you see somebody on campus who's wearing a Washington Redskins jersey or some other Native American mascot on their clothing, just approach them and very nicely say, do you know that what you're wearing is very offensive and harmful to people. The Native American Student Association, also known as NASA, provides an opportunity for students to learn more. The main thing that students, whether you're Native or non-Native, get out of NASA um, is just educating yourself more on Native issues, um, whether they're here in La Crosse or on this campus or um, more like nationwide, just Native American issues.
Another option for students at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse is to enroll in an ethnic racial studies course. The courses aim to foster an understanding of the histories, cultures, and contemporary issues of ethnic and racial groups in their national context. One of the things I hope students come away with after taking a class with me is I hope that they uh, come away with being able to look at things from multiple perspectives. Right. Often the perspective students come in with their first year, it's largely a perspective that has been shaped by their parents, their grandparents, their siblings, but they don't necessarily have views or ideals of their own that are very developed. And so one of the things I try to do is offer multiple perspectives. Sometimes that is a counter perspective or a counter narrative to that which they may have. Um, Sometimes I take a position that may be opposite of that which I believe, just in an effort to try to challenge them about their own ideas, their own views. One course in particular focuses on stereotypical imagery in contemporary media. One of the things that we try to do in that particular course, while the emphasis and the focus is on stereotypes and the origins of those stereotypes, how those things evolved, how those stereotypes came about, it is also our attempt to try to uh, be conscious of and present images of those groups as they want to be represented themselves, right? Rather than from just the perspective of, of whites in the media or in the mainstream media. Students should inform themselves about harmful imagery, but it starts with the educators in our school systems. The knowledge usually obtained in a classroom about racially diverse groups is insufficient. Teachers in, in schools K through 12 and even higher, uh, they have to fall back if they are called upon to discuss these issues. They have to fall back on what they know and often what they know are the stereotypes. We probably have to be better at not only talking about Native American issues, but just racial issues in general, uh, issues of difference and diversity in general. I don't, I don't think we always do a very good job at that. These are the faces of American Indians today. They deal with these obstacles daily, and their struggles are real. It is true that awareness is the first step, but knowing that there is a problem doesn't solve the problem. Education should evoke action, and these actions are the key to changing these patterns. <laughs>